Hi, this is Steve at BlessedHopeForever.com. This is June the 1st. We're going into a new month. And we are eagerly awaiting our rescue, our final redemption of our bodies. I hope that's the case. If not, then I guess we're looking at September. Or it could come any day in between. Until then, until that time, we're going to continue on in our study through 1 Corinthians. We've been looking at chapter 7. Uh, the subject of marriage, Christian marriage, and uh, relationships within that context. And so we're going to continue on with that, uh, Lord willing. I want to say right here from the outset that we are the body of Christ. We're bone of His bone. We're flesh of His flesh. We've been bought with a price. We're only here for a short time. What's a hundred years compared to eternity? Uh, our lives are like a vapor. Uh, they're, you know, they just we uh, we wither away like the blade of grass. Uh, it just it seems like yesterday. That, you know, I was in first grade and my teacher ran out on the playground, crying because John F. Kennedy was assassinated. Time goes by quickly. I think we're going to see that in the text. And I think uh, when we read that in the text, in this particular context, I think it carries a lot of uh, weight as far as how we interpret uh, the reason for, for why God says that we should remain in that uh, condition in which we were called, that, that calling whereby we were called. I do not believe that divorce is a uh, any greater a sin than lying or or stealing or or any other sin that you can imagine. Folks, sin is sin, and it's always amazed me how that you could go to prison, you could kill someone, and go to prison, uh, serve thirty years, forty years, fifty years behind bars, and you you can get out and you can. Uh, uh, you become a Christian, uh, you can uh, uh, preach behind a pulpit, and what a wonderful testimony that is. But if you've been divorced, whole different story. And I don't know why I can't, personally I don't understand why that, that, is, uh, that stigma is so attached to, to those who have been divorced, because it seems, to, at least in my opinion, to, to violate a lot of scripture that pertains to God's working in us both the will and do of His good pleasure. So we're going to talk a little bit about that. I hope that you are following us through in these studies and gaining, benefiting from that. I uh, love and appreciate all of your comments. Uh, I read every one. I may not be able to respond to every one, but I, I do read all of your comments, and those comments keep me encouraged as we continue on uh, throughout our studies here. I also want to point out that uh, a couple other facts that I've pointed out previously on, on more than one occasion, and that is you don't have to agree with anything that I say. Uh, I, I don't, I'm not some oracle of truth. Uh, I do pray that the Holy Spirit filter out the error, and we're going to do that right now. Gracious Heavenly Father, I just come into your presence by means of our Lord Jesus Christ and in the Holy Spirit, so very thankful for the understanding you've given us, the instruction and the guidance, the, the fact that, that the Holy Spirit is our comforter and our teacher. We're so aware of our limitations and, and our understanding your word, but we also know that we have the, the Holy Spirit to guide and direct us. So I just ask that he would filter out that which is foolish, but just seal to our hearts that which is truth. For it's in Christ's name I pray. Amen. You know, it's amazing. You got some non-believers believing that the end is near. Uh, the apocalypse is right around the corner. While some Christians are struggling not to doubt it. Uh, we don't need another sign, folks. And God is not in the business of writing the date of the rapture in the sky with lightning uh, or hiding it in some 
mysterious dark corner of the text somewhere. Uh, but the living word that I know whom we await is drawing us deeper into the written word as we await the living word. You know, the Logos who became flesh and died in our place. Uh, substitutionary death. That I do know. What if God's purpose in our waiting, uh, the Word, was to draw us deeper into the Word? Uh, doesn't seem too far-fetched an idea to me. So we're look, we've been looking at sex, adultery, circumcision, virginity. I mean, lovely, lovely topics for some guy like me to, to talk about in a video. I'm, I'm much more comfortable, I guess, explaining how a male donkey and a mare horse make a mule. But the text requires that we look at it and we think about it, pray about it, meditate it uh, on it. Uh, this is not Paul's word, not his logic, his reasoning. This is timeless. It's God's word. Uh, uh, and so we're looking at the almighty, sovereign word of God. It's, uh, it wasn't relegated just to Paul's time. What God has joined together, okay, let no man put asunder. The text really pushes the idea of undistracted devotion to the Lord. Our lifespan is short. Uh, we see that right in the text. I think that, that explains a lot of what's going on. And I pointed out what will our ministry be, our testimony to be, you know, as that mirrored image of Christ's relationship to the church in our marriage. Those uh, who are married, they're to remain married, not separate. Uh, or if the wife leaves her husband, she's to be reconciled to her husband. She's, she's married as long as her husband lives. And of course, uh, you know, Christ is eternal. And, uh, but, uh, and I, I pointed out in the last video, I mentioned uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, uh, the reconciliation there that we saw in the text that uh, he's reconciled us to himself. He's given to us the ministry of reconciliation, that God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses against them. We, we live in a very unique age in which God is not even imputing men's trespasses against them. And yet we live, for the most part, most Christians do, the organized religious system is focused on law, not Christ. He's committed unto us that word of reconciliation to realize that we have been reconciled to God, that we are ambassadors for Christ. As though God did beseech you by us, we pray you, those that is living under law, in Christ's stead, be ye reconciled to God. And the reason for that, he gives the reason, and that is because he has made him to be sin for us who knew no sin that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. You stand before God holy, unblameable, and unreprovable in his sight. Man's sin resulted in bloodshed and death. Christ's shed blood resulted in life. So we looked a little bit at the unfaithful spouse, uh, spouses, plural, both sides of the, of the, of the equation. And, and that perfectly describes Israel, I mean perfectly, okay, with there being the wife of Jehovah, and yet they uh, were repeated, repeatedly they were involved in idolatry. And it also describes what most Christians have done today in my opinion, and that is they, they're living in spiritual adultery, having an affair with the law while being a spouse to Christ. The text says we're to live according to our calling as just as God has distributed to every man. And yet we want to judge each man in that regard, or each woman. Uh, we're to remain in that. Let, them, let us walk in that in which... God has, has ordained, and, and Paul says he's ordained this in all the churches, all the churches. 
if we've called while being circumcised, we don't become uncircumcised. Many of you, you people out there would probably scratch your heads over that one. Like, how does that happen? Well, it actually, there were, in the past, there were attempts to do that. Um, circumcision's nothing. Uncircumcision is nothing. But the keeping of the commandment of God. We don't change ourselves, adjust ourselves to fit some man's set of standards, okay? especially when it comes to the law. We're to abide in that same calling wherein we were called. If we were called being a servant, uh, well, we, uh, a slave, well, we're, we're a slave of Jesus Christ, but if we're a physical slave, we're not to care for that too much. If we can be free, be free, try to be free. But the, the point is, is that He's called us as what we are. And uh, we are the Lord's freemen, okay? We're free in Christ. And we are Christ's servant, His bond slave. And we were bought with a price. And we know what that price was. And so we're not to be the servants of men. We're not to allow men to dictate how we should live in according to their own commandments and laws and customs and so on and so forth. Let every man wherein he's called therein abide with God, remain with God. And I think that's profound. Okay. Now concerning the virgins, uh, Paul says he has no commandment of the Lord, yet he, he's given his judgment. This was something the Lord had not revealed, but Paul's giving his opinion as one who has obtained mercy of the Lord uh, to be faithful. That it's, it's good, given the present distress, and that's, that, that's timeless, okay? It's the same dis distress today as oh, we have our own unique day of distress. That it's, it's good for a man, so to be. If we're bound uh, to a wife, we don't seek to be loosed, okay? But, but if we marry, we haven't sinned. And if a virgin marry, she hasn't sinned. Nevertheless, such shall have trouble in the flesh. And I believe, as, as many do, that uh, many Christian couples, young cr couples, are getting married without realizing what they're getting into. He's trying to spare them that concern. The time is short, says the text, verse 29. The time is short, okay? What's a hundred years? It flies by in an instant. And so... Both they that have wives be as though they had none. They that weep as though they wept not. They that rejoice as though they rejoice not. How can you not see in this, in these, in these words, the uh, the sense of of the Holy Spirit, his the message that he's trying to convey that time is of the essence. Time is short. Those that, that buy as though they possess not. They that use this world is not abusing it. For the fashion of this world passes away. We, don't, we only have a short time to, uh, for God to be glorified in our lives. And that's the major concern on the part of the Holy Spirit. He would have us without concern. He prefers there's always something better than the other thing. Okay, He would have us unconcerned. Not have those worries. To have undistracted devotion to the Lord. Not care, just care about what things, how we may please our spouse, uh, because that's that's the case. That's just a fact. The one that's married cares for the things of the world, how he may please his wife, and vice versa. And there's a difference also between a wife and a virgin. Uh, the unmarried. Uh, woman cares for the things of the Lord that she may be holy both in body and in spirit but she that's married cares for the things of the world how she may please her husband and it just that's the that's the it really is the ideal Christian marriage uh, scripture doesn't look down on that we tend to look you know don't don't make the mistake of looking at that as a bad thing okay uh, we each have our gift that's the point that we, we need to nail down here. He's speaking this to our prophet, okay? That, uh, that we might attend upon the Lord without distraction, okay? 
Why? Because our time is short, folks. Our, our lives pass by in the blink of an eye. Don't force your virgin daughter into fornication. If she wants to get married, you know, let her marry. And uh, the text says, If any man think that he behaves in himself uncomely toward his virgin, if she passes the flower of her age and, and, and uh, needs so require, let him do what he will, he sinneth not. Let them marry. Now, either way, whether, whether the, the father doesn't let his daughter marry whether he does let his daughter marry, it's he hasn't sinned. But uh, if he's if he stands fast in his heart, having no necessity, but has power over his own will, and is so decreed in his heart that he'll keep his virgin, not allow her to marry, then he does well. Okay. So he that gives her in marriage doeth well, but he that d giveth her not doeth better. There's always a better thing in life. Okay. You know, left, right, you know, which way are you going to go? There's always a better thing. And we're looking at the better thing. God calls it the better thing. Now, we tend to not do that. We tend to not think that's the better thing. But, of course, it is. Because why? Because our lives are temporal. Okay? The wife is bound by the law as long as her husband lives. But if her husband be dead, she's at liberty to be married to whom she will only in the Lord. No unequal yokes. Okay? being yoked unequally okay but she's happier if she so abide after my judgment and I think also that I have the spirit of God Paul ends it with confirming that uh, these are uh, Holy Spirit driven thoughts even though that God himself may not have revealed something specifically to Paul Circumcision and slavery, two things, two things that are heavily are connected with law-keeping as a rule of life, okay? Uh, back in, uh, in the old, old days, if, if any man was converted after being circumcised, he wasn't to remove every trace of his connection with Judaism. You know, it was an identification, a mark of identification. It's interesting, we've been identified with Christ in His burial resurre and resurrection. We've been identified with Him in His death burial and resurrection. We're not the Jew who identifies himself with God through circumcision. But there's a spiritual side of that, act, aspect of that. Uh, so not to act as, as he was required to undo what was done for him by his Jewish parents or, or, or other people, uh, any man, in fact. Uncircumcision, having been a Gentile by birth, let him not be circumcised, okay? And that's what the law teachers, the, the Pharisees, the, the Judaizers were, uh, that's what they were urging Gentile converts to, to do, is to receive circumcision as uh, believing that that was necessary for salvation. It's not enough to believe in Christ. We've also got to keep the law. Paul declared that to be a renouncing of the gospel in Galatians chapter 5. So circumcision is nothing. Uncircumcision is nothing. Uh, it, it won't uh, either promote uh, uh, or obstruct our salvation. The one point here is keeping the commandments of God. That's guard in the Greek. It's you've hit it in your heart. It's, we're not back under law. Don't read that and put yourself back under law. You're not under law. You're under grace. The commandments of God. Under this present dispensation, the word is tereo, uh, a prison guard. That's what the word means. It's, it's, it means a final safekeeping, uh, a well-kept preservation. It's used of the place of detention. Okay, it's literally a safekeeping place. Okay, for God's commandments and imperatives, under grace. That's what that says. And so we know from other scripture that it's it's the duty of every Christian to be content with his present circumstances. Our uh, happiness uh, does not depend upon it does not uh, depend upon on what we are in Christ uh, uh, if we uh, 
it's or what we think we are is, is what I'm, you know, well, I don't think I'm much in Christ. And so, you know, my, so my happiness, my contentment is pretty much determined by, it's a, it's a it becomes a, a, a walk by sight, not by faith. It's basically what I'm, I'm trying to say here is, uh, uh, our, our comfort, our happiness, it does not depend on, on, uh, what we are in the world, but what we are in Christ. We should be content in all circumstances. We know that. Quiet uh, and content. We're to abide in the condition in which we were placed by divine providence. And this is where Christians, this is where there's a big hang-up, it seems, among Christians because they think that somehow God stepped out of the picture. He's no longer in control. God directs your steps, folks. Whether you're married, unmarried, divorced, un not divorced, you know, uh, and that and that un uncircumcision that could literally not be done. But the but he's referring to certain efforts which were made in the past, where they tried to remove the marks of circumcision, which were actually often attempted by those who were ashamed of having been circumcised. Uh, that practice is often alluded to in Jewish writings. If you want to go back and look at them, uh, uh, circumcision itself makes uh, men debtors to do the whole law. We know that from Scripture, where that Christ becomes of no effect, okay? Because you've been married to Christ uh, and you're, you're still continuing on having an affair with the law, which amounts to spiritual adultery. You were bought with a price. Okay, verse 23. And, and this carries on the, the idea of Friedman of the previous verse. You were bought with a great price, even the blood of Christ, purchased by God as freedmen. You're free. You're not under law. Okay? Do not become the slaves of men. Okay? If, if you're, if you're an elder in a church and you know, elders get together and they say this person can't preach upon the pulpit because he's been divorced well now you now that's that's basically what you're looking at you become the slaves of men okay uh the serve the word servant the slave there do loss in the greek is um, we've we have all become slaves of christ okay but we're free we're freed men who are slaves and there were slaves, literally physical slaves, who were freedmen, free men in Christ. And uh, so we are bound by God's laws, but these commandments, these imperatives that we see, but many of those imperatives are telling you not to live under law. So, you know, in this dispensation, you've got to, you got, you, you got to be careful and not put yourself under law when, you, when you're under grace. And you certainly don't want to be trying to put others under law to get them under grace. You don't want to do that either. That doesn't work very well. But we are redeemed uh, by God from sin, Satan, and the law. I've, I've named six things in the past. Sin, self, the law, the world, Satan, even death. Called by the grace of God. Called His servants. Purchased with His blood. He owns us. We're not to please ourselves. And that's, that's where many marriages go south. We're not here to please, please ourselves. We're not here that long. Our time here, folks, is just too short to begin with. Okay? But these Corinthians, they were not to be subject to the doctrines and the commandments of men. You know, whether these relate to Jewish customs, laws, ceremonies, or, or Gentile superstitions, or pagan idol worship, or, or whatever, or a mixture of both. They were to call no man master upon the earth, they weren't to allow any man to lord it over them, as the false teachers very much did, and uh, and still do, today. But to acknowledge Christ, who had bought them, folks, we've been bought with a, a price, a precious price. In our time, we're to redeem the days, the time, because the days are evil. Uh, so the illusion there seems to be. Uh, uh, to a tradition of the Jews that the Israelites, you know, they are how that they were redeemed out of Egypt and they were the servants of God. They were not the servants of men. 
Uh, let not him who is free cast away his liberty. Okay. Uh, you just you don't see anything but grace through these through these passages. Uh, God doesn't condemn the divorced. Okay, He doesn't abandon the divorced. Uh, Matthew five thirty two. I say unto you that whosoever shall put away his wife, saving for the cause of adultery, the word adultery is not there. It's fornication. The word is fornication. In other words, she she comes to him. The woman comes this. She comes to to the guy presenting herself as a virgin, and it turns out she's not. Okay, that's happened. All right. Uh, Dearly beloved, we cannot ostracize people for going through situations that God, the almighty, sovereign, majestic God of all creation, has ordained for their lives. And believe me, He has ordained their walk. And in situations which we ourselves believe that we wouldn't be involved in, it's like, no, I would never be involved in that. Uh, folks, God is either working in us both the will to do and do of His good pleasure, or He's not. Okay, that includes all of those who are in messy relationships, or, or who are have come out of messy relationships. God has distributed to every man as the Lord hath called every one. So let him walk, and so ordain I in all churches, all churches. Okay, every single church you step into. Okay. There ought to be grace and love and acceptance shown for every member of the body of Christ, no matter what their station in life is, no matter where they come from, uh, whatever they come out of, whatever situation they're involved in, whatever difficulty, whatever tragedy, whatever, whatever in life, uh, they're not to be stigmatized. The law, the law under Moses was that you could, you could, a man could divorce his wife, but it was because of the hardness of their hearts. Under grace, I don't see how that that we can uh, uh, sort of, I guess the the way I would put it is under grace, I don't see how that we can sort of. Uh, combine that hardness of heart with our walk and relationship with God and one another, which is by grace. Um, there's a whole lot more that can be said about this chapter, but I'm going to go ahead and move on. We're going to go into chapter 8. Uh, it's, it's, it has been a little bit uh, of an uncomfortable teaching for me in, in the sense, well, in just uh, uh, I, I'm, look, don't misunderstand me. There's so many wonderful truths here that that we see that are just immersed in God's love, mercy, and grace. But it's been a little bit tough for me, given the fact that uh, that I'm not. Uh, I've just never been one that's very been very comfortable talking about personal things. Uh, you know, as uh, even from a pulpit. Uh, or this chair. Uh, I would I would love it if you all would continue to pray for the direction of this ministry, and I would love it even more if you would just nail down pat, okay? The 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 one concept here that every single person that you see in this chapter. God has ordained their walk. If, if we miss seeing that, then I think we miss seeing the, the very essence, the very uh, the sense of the passage. Uh, because there's so many out there that are hurting and despondent and uh, concerned about their future and where they're, how they're going to, to cope uh, with the um, mess that they're in, you know, whether it's a marriage or it's anything else. And what we need to understand first and foremost is that God loves us, that He, He's always loved us. His love is never changing and it's unending. 
and that he has uh, his best in mind for us, that he doesn't allow anything to touch our lives except for, for it to, to be for our ultimate good. That's a hard thing to do when you see your, what appears to be the world crashing down around you and you know, you know your, your spouse left you and uh, you know, I don't know, maybe you're homeless, uh, you, you know, maybe you're on drugs, uh, you know, or alcohol, whatever the case, you know, and, and so you feel like that your life is worthless and God has abandoned you and nothing could be further than the truth. God has a reason and a purpose for all of the difficulties that we face in life. And I think that we see that even in this passage of chapter 7. Rest in Him, dearly beloved. Until next time, this is Steve. Thanks for watching.